Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War news update, second part thereof for the 2nd of February 2024. I must do this rather quickly because I have a live stream coming up with Danielle from Turchny um, about FPV drones and other uh, affiliated subjects. Something I, I forgot to, I actually, I don't know where the link went to this. I meant to discuss this earlier. This is concerning what Rebar's rhetoric was. So Rebar's a pro-Russian source, one of the big aligned with the M Russian MED sources that gives you, you know, information on the war. What they said about the attack on the Ivanovets ship. And this came out sort of prior to the footage that the Ukrainians produced of the ship being sunk very clearly. And I think this is an absolutely fascinating insight into the disinformation involved in Russian uh, military communications. When I am asked by pro Kremlin voices, why don't you talk about the uh, Ukrainian losses? Look, this is what the Russians say that you. Ukrainians lost. This is what the, the claims are from this side. Why do you only uh, produce statistics from that side? And it's because the statistics and the claims from the Russian side are routinely absolute bunkum. They're just abject nonsense. And here's another example. So the what Rebar claimed while the attacks or just after the attacks on the Russian ship took place at night, or at least actually the morning after at night, the attack by Ukrainian formations continued. Nine unmanned boats left Odessa and the mouth of the Danube River in the direction of Crimea. So this is interesting because this seems to like bona fide information about a number of naval drones that, that left Ukrainian waters to attack the Russians, right? So there is definitely some connection with Russian intel here. Four of them were just, there's no way that the that, that rebar is going to sit there and have that kind of knowledge as some random dude on the internet, right? So this is a setup that is connected to Russian intelligence. Four of them were discovered by Russian sailors at the entrance to Lake Donoslav, uh, Fire was opened on them, a, as a result of which four drones were destroyed. So this is a claim that four drones attacked at the mouth of the, the, the lake where the ship was recorded as being destroyed and sunk. And this is a claim that all four drones were destroyed there. Okay, so no threat to the ship. One of the drones exploded right next to the side of the boat, damaging it. Okay, so we do have a little bit of an admission of damage. There is no data on the extent of the damage at the time. We, of course, have seen footage of one drone causing fundamental damage to the side of the ship and another drone driving into that same hole to explode within it. And then that seems to have cooked off munitions that were inside and a massive explosion took place and it sank. Two patrol boats, two helicopters and a fighter jet were sent to search for the four remaining drones. So now there are four other drones. So four drones have blown up. One got through, hit the side of the boat, and four other drones were hunted down by helicopters and fighter jets. Uh, during the operation, they were hit and scuttled. So nine drones, eight of them blown up. One got through, caused, a li caused some amount of damage to the side of the boat against what the, see that came out before the ukrainians then said oh that's what you say happened here's the information we have uh because here is a whole bunch of drone footage which basically dispels the entirety pretty much of what is claimed here or at least there then had to have been a whole bunch of other drones if, if the U russians really did blow up eight drones out of the nine then there had to be another five drones uh that that attacked as well that rebar isn't talking about or it's just an outright lie about the drones that were destroyed so i th thought that was really worth sharing with you to call e as if we need to do that anymore to call further question on the russian claims here and that is an mod aligned um russian information source right moving on to military aid and equipment from the so Yesterday, I did a breaking news update that the 50 billion euro package had been unanimously voted on. Hungary didn't vote against it. Victor Orban didn't vote against it. And it has got through. This is great. From the agreed 50 billion euro package, Ukraine expects to receive the first payment of 4.5 billion euros in March. This is reported by the press service in the Ministry of the Economy. Currently, the government is working on the corresponding agreement on transitional funding together with European partners. The message reads. Uh, then 
the White House talked about the EU funding for Ukraine being no substitute for US leadership and military assistance. This is interesting messaging, and I think it's spot on. I think um, he needs to say this. Uh, so this is John Kirby saying, the US welcomed the EU's decision to approve 50 billion euros, uh, $54 billion dollars, um, Ukraine facility, but stressed that this funding is no substitute for the US military aid. US National Security Sp Council spokesman John Kirby said, quote, it's not a substitute for American leadership when it comes to security assistance. And it's why it's so critical for us to continue to urge Congress to pass a national security supplemental. Why this is important, because there could be the situa a situation where um, American naysayer lawmakers might go, well, there's no need for us to provide that $60 billion package now because the Europeans have done that 50 billion dollar package i mean the issue is that that 50 billion dollar package is over four years and actually when you look at it as a percentage of gdp is not a very big package so although i've been like yeah this is amazing it's great because they need that uh it isn't as huge as you think but before you say well the europeans are doing a rubbish job this and you ukraine the latest podcast talked about this yesterday said that actually this is this does a couple of things one it is about long-term sustainable assistance so it's not just about here's a bunch now right we're off down a pub it's like four years worth of of aid in fact they the ukraine latest didn't they they were asking is is have there been any other examples about long dis long term aid being given and they came up well no not that we are aware of actually that's low rubbish because norway have done that i think other Baltic, uh, other Baltic nations have done that. I think the EU has done that in other packages and uh, possibly other Nordic nations other than Norway. So there has been this move to start giving assistance to Ukraine in in uh, within a a a, a time frame that's uh, long standing, right? Within a framework that gives sustained, uh, continued assistance to Ukraine, um, and this is part of that. Um, so it is that, but it also provides a foundation. It's that, right, this is what the EU is doing, and then you can add bilateral things on top of that. And I know there's arguments between, say, Germany and the EU with, with regard to, well, if we're giving $8 billion, 8 billion euros worth of, of assistance to Ukraine, we need that taken off of what we are giving, you know, in, in packages like this 50 billion euro package. So, okay, there are arguments there, but the idea is, that, yeah, this might not be like the biggest package as it's spread over four years amongst 30 countries, uh, or 29 country 27 countries sorry um but it is it is still a a great um package to act as a foundation from which you can add more right or to which you can add more um in 2022 uh, so just uh, going on uh, off that eu funding now uh, actually i will return to it in the geopolitical section in terms of the political ramifications um, in 2022, uh, we actually created the drone market from scratch. Now more than 200 Ukrainian companies are engaged in drones. Uh, I've talked a, a number of times recently about how I think Ukraine is outproducing or out procuring drones to, uh, to provide their soldiers on a front line with capabilities. And I think that they are doing a much better job than is being uh, discussed or being communicated by Ukrainian um, information sources. And I think... There could be a bit of psyops going on here. There could be this idea that the Ukrainians are are so the claim is often that the Russians are outproducing the Ukrainians, and the Russians themselves claim this. I just think that is not a true claim. I think they're over egging their production uh, abilities. There, they're saying, "Oh, we can produce three hundred thousand drones a month." Well, whoop de doo! I don't think you can. Where's the proof on the front line? Uh, are we seeing that um, track? with data from the front line no we're not so i don't think you're doing that and i think you're saying that to try and like big yourselves up um and then ukrainians might also be saying that to try and paint themselves into a worse position than they are in order to to chivy along international aid and this might be a case with even shell um provision although i'm not sure that's like that would be completely speculative but i do get the sense also that the ukrainians aren't able to capture the amount of drones in kind of data the amount of drones that are being procured by individual units fundraising and getting them in and people like you know greg terry and atp geopolitics and professor gerdes and rick the ukrainian you know raising all the money that we have done 
in order to, uh, at least for some of that money, buy a bunch of drones and take them to the front line. No, no government agency is counting those drones. So I think there's an awful lot of this other stuff that goes on that that needs to be, um, you know, I think factored into drone production. But anyway, Fedorov, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of uh, Digital Transformation of Ukraine, announced uh, that during 2023, it was possible to significantly scale up Ukrainian production of drones. 67 models received codification, 58 received a state contract, and you got 200 drone companies, and then you got the state manufacturers, and you got international partners as well. The, the, the whole setup is is... is far-reaching and, and pretty incredible and there was a claim recently that they are producing more drones than they can afford in other words the the state can't afford to buy all the drones that are being produced so i think the ukrainians are probably doing all right in drone production the ukrainian lancet uh, is being produced uh, an equivalent to that artificial intelligence for automatic capture of targets by drone which we've actually seen footage of guided mun ammunition aiming at the means of uh, radio electronic warfare and hitting them anti-drone solutions electronic warfare robotic platforms all of these things almost every week a new unit receives codification according to nato standards i mean this is this is quite incredible I and mean, just a picture like that tells you you know that's a thousand words isn't it in in the drone capabilities but on show just in that we've got you know larger ones not octocopters but i don't know how many hexacopters if that's a thing um you know shahid types uh, reconnaissance drones all these fpv type drones all those different capabilities there russian channels are sharing modernized mines allegedly dropped by ukrainians using drones in the crinky area inconspicuously named johnny the new detonator uh no one no one should trigger johnny don't trigger me i will explode uh, can trigger the mine from a di from a shut up, from a distance. The armed forces of Ukraine says this Russian source uh, carry out mining of Krinky and the surrounding area using drones. The Ukrainian military has modernized the PTM three, equipping it with a special detonator, which they call Johnny. These detonators are equipped with gyroscopes, accelerometers, and magnetometers to detonate the mine upon impact or movement after being placed on the ground. Johnny detonators can also go off when armoured vehicles or even soldiers with weapons or armour drive near a mined area. So there are lots of ways of triggering Johnny. Uh, I can give you a whole host of other things that will trigger Johnny. Right, Richard again here saying, I just wanted to pick up on this point. I'm not trying to have a go at what Richard says. He's been a great viewer of the channel. But Germany's given 1,000 155mm artillery shells. France, 3,000 per month, 155mm. Uh, Britain, zero. Europe has delivered 300,000, actually 600,000 plus of the 1 million pledged last year. Uh, a laughy face. It, I don't know why that's funny, but... um. Just to let you know that actually Europe are getting closer to it's got it's by the end of March and they're at least at six hundred thousand now as far as I know, with a view to procure others outside of the production. So actually they've done a really good job of working towards that. And the idea that Britain has has, has produced zero uh, shells for Ukraine is is demonstrable demonstrably nonsense. Um, so here is uh, what what is this? This is a UK Defence Journal from. Um, I can't remember f when this is from. Anyway, you can imagine. Oh, yeah, sorry, January. So this is fairly recent. So Britain having donated over 300,000 artillery rounds to Ukraine. So that's not none. That is 300,000. Uh, is increasing its production cap capability of 155 mil shells eightfold. But the confirmation came in light of a response to a reply to a parliamentary written question. Uh, Daniel Kawaszynski, MP for the uh, Conservative MP for Shrewsbury and a Atcham, asked to ask the Secretary of State for Defence what steps he is taking to help increase production of 155mm shells. James Cartledge, MP for uh, the Minister of State for Defence, replied, quote, The Ministry of Defence placed an order in June 2023 with BAE Systems to provide an eightfold increase in production capability of 155mm shells. The MOD contract is for significant initial quantities of 155mm shells which will reinstate and build sovereign capability and stockpiles in respect of artillery ammunition being provided to uk ukraine since the start of the conflict the uk has donated over 300,000 rounds of artillery ammunition including 155 mil and former soviet union calibers so we didn't have that much in the stockpiles we pro we provided a bunch and then we also went around the world buying up stocks of um soviet era ammunition particularly to get to ukraine because that's what they really needed at the time and they still do obviously so uh, just make sure that if claims are being made i know it's just a youtube thread whatever but you know this is a, a place that i curate 
so that we get accurate information. And and if you've got, I don't know, if you're chomping at the bit to just have a go at Europe and then have a go at Britain, like fair enough. I, I'm not quite sure why that's a good use of of energy. But make sure that you're correct in what you claim. Like, let's all make sure that we are correct as much as possible in what we claim. Now, interestingly, BAE Systems also is involved in making a lot of ammunition artillery around the world. Like, you can argue that Britain's military industrial complex has a very important role to play in the provision of artillery ammunition for Ukraine, whether it's directly from the UK government contracts or in 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 being the capability to produce worldwide. BAE Systems is, and I'm not defending the UK because I'm some kind of British, uh, you know, crazy jingoistic nationalist type so, sort of person. I'm not that, and you know that. But I will stand up for the UK when, you know, misinformation is being spread or, or at least claims are, are erroneous. So, you know, I, I, I think I was saying previously that BA systems needed to be contracted earlier. So I thought June 2023 was was late to the game there. But already we had done an awful lot in terms of uh, ammunition production so uh, or provision. German aid for Ukraine says German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development alone has provided medical support to more than 3 million Ukrainians since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. So when I was replying to, I think, another of Richard's quotes yesterday and talking about the difference in uh, assistance that countries give to Ukraine, I looked at the Kiel Institute tra uh, Ukraine aid tracker and look and say, and I'm not trying to pick on the US, but it's about different ways of, of understanding the aid that, that different countries give. Right. The US and indeed the UK have not been very big, for example, on supporting refugees. We've done a little bit more than the US, but obviously not many Ukrainians are going to go all the way to the US. Right. So they're going to stay geographically local and getting to the UK is a bit more of an effort than getting to Poland or Germany. So Poland and Germany do an awful lot for refugees. And that money and assistance isn't always explicit money for refugees it's like within their healthcare systems it's within um their education systems that then being loaded on with more and more pressure they have to spend more on education to be able to deal with the influx of ukrainian refugees it's about housing so all these areas there are countries that are doing an absolutely phenomenal job that other countries aren't doing it's not criticism of the us or the uk it's just that there are naturally going to be pressures on countries that are far more local to Ukraine than these other countries. But when you're looking at, oh, look how much the U how much the US has done, or look how much Britain has done, or look how much uh, you know France has done, and and then you look at how much like Poland, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Germany, Hungary, um, Slovakia, these nations that are much closer that have had to deal with uh, this influx of of refugees and actually you need to take we need to take that into account so the german ministry of economic cooperation and development alone has provided medical support for more than three million ukrainians since the beginning of the full-scale invasion and that will be also treatment for injured soldiers that the germans are helping with that maybe other other nations aren't so much this includes surgeries medical treatment training of personnel and the provision of vital medical equipment and psychosocial support this was announced by minister um at uh, german minister at the german ukrainian healthcare conference in berlin which is also being attended by the ukrainian minister of healthcare um I th it's stuff like this it's fantastic that germany for example are doing a really good job at that we need to recognize because this kind of sometimes gets forgotten when you're just looking at well how many bullets have been sent how many shells have been sent well you guys have done more than these guys and these guys have done more than those guys or whatever it's like well actually there are loads of countries that are doing other things outside of the military support that it what you could just got to think of each country just has a, a bunch of resources money and stuff like countries is money, people and stuff, right? And you've got however many units of money, people and stuff. Bigger the country are, usually in the Western world, the more money, money stuff and units you've got. Is everyone giving a fair amount of money, stuff and units and even people to help do things to help Ukraine? Like, okay, you're giving loads more stuff, but what about like medical care? Uh, and you know units of help and all, and units of resources you know there are different ways of calculating these things and certain countries do things that we don't realize okay kaya kalas from uh estonia the estonian prime minister has said 
uh, Europe has tripled the production of shells for Ukraine. However, um, EU countries have failed to reach the ambitious goal. So it was ambitious and, and like uh, criticizing not reaching a million, like I keep saying, is not useful. I don't know why. I don't focus on the negative, focus on a positive and say, look, this is a trajectory of where we're going. So how, you know, we didn't reach the ambitious goal of one million rounds, but we've tripled production. So that's what you want to concentrate on. Trip, the tripling of production, which is astonishing, is, is brilliant and is going to continue uh, moving forward in that way. Germans armed concern, Rheinmetall brought a controlling stake in the Romanian car manufacturer Auto Mechanica Medias. This was reported in the press service of the enterprise. It's noted that Rheinmetall will own 75-2.5% of the shares of the Romanian enterprise already named Rheinmetall Auto Mechanica SRL, which will play a key role in servicing combat vehicles in Ukraine, as well as in providing their logistical support the concern emphasised. So Rheinmetall getting involved in Romania, and Romania being a neighbour, being able to give decent repair facilities to uh, Ukrainian vehicles uh, damaged on the front line. A Swedish Scanjak 3500 mine clearing vehicle in service, service of the Ukrainians here. That looks pretty good. Uh, nice big piece of kit. Hopefully helping to demine the area, which is massively important, not just for the safety of human beings, but also for the ability to farmers to farm their land to generate income for the defense of, you know, to help fund the defense of Ukraine. It's so super important. Right. Australian Hornets, these F-15, F-18, sorry, uh, F-15. F a18 hornet fighters that australia have about 40 of basically have been rejected by ukraine previously lots of people still asking why aren't they going to ukraine we don't need your flying trash i think it's a bit harsh misunderstanding scuttles a transfer 41 australian hornets this is reporting yahoo news but actually was in originally in the australian financial review it's behind a paywall and i haven't got the archive version uh, so i've just got you this senior ukrainian air force official refused an offer from two australians to receive 41 of the country's decommissioned hornet fighters bluntly stating that we do not need your fine trash reported the australian financial review it's probably a bit of a pr um shot in the foot there this statement effectively killed the deal highlighting a stark misunderstanding between australia and ukraine amid ukrainian pilots desperate attempts to evade russian aircraft the incident occurred as ukraine was navigating the challenges of avoiding russian fighters revealing a significant miscommunication between the two nations australia stands as the world's seventh largest military spender based on purchasing power according to the Lowy institute prime minister albanese claimed that australia is among the top military aid donors to ukraine outside nato nevertheless the relationship between the two countries military has been strained by reluctance from Australian Defence Ministry to fulfil Ukraine's request for surplus equipment. This includes the MRH-90 Taipan helicopters, which are already being dismantled when Ukraine requested them in December. Unlike many other countries, Australia has chosen not to reopen its embassy in Kiev, diminishing direct contract contact between the nations. Ukraine's government, including Zelensky and his advisors, sends mixed signals about its military needs, complicating negotiations. Um, so on and so forth. Yeah, the oh, actually, no, let's continue. The idea of Australia providing Hornet fighters was initially proposed in March last year. And by two months later, news emerged that the US government was favorably disposed towards the transfer of the aircraft, which had been in service with the Royal Australian Air Force since 1984 and were retired in 2021. The Hornets designed by for aircraft carriers having robust landing gears suitable for Ukraine's war-damaged runways, enabling them to take off and land on short strips. Ukraine, however, began discussions with the US and European governments for the less robust F-16 fighting Falcons, fearing the logistical challenges of operating two types of foreign fighters simultaneously. Uh, that's obviously a real uh, shame that that's not going to happen. Um, I don't quite understand what the miscommunication was and how that really uh, uh, arose. Um, but yeah, there is, there is seemingly a fairly solid answer there as to whether they will be provided. It's not looking like it. Right. This is another example of how America are getting around the issue of uh, an impasse in Congress. I've talked about this with regard to Turkey. I've talked about this with regard to um, T-72s, I think it is, from um, from Morocco. We talked about it with regard to some tanks from, doo -doo -doo -doo, was it UAE, uh, a bunch of the older... Uh, remodeled Croatian was it or Serbian uh, T72 models the M1A8 or something um, anyway the, the, the US is enabling these things to get to Ukraine by using things like EDA and other mechanisms to allow for that here Russia is 
is overtly condemning Ecuador's decision to send Russian military equipment to the US for Ukraine. So this, I reported on this recently, how it looked like Ecuador were going to get uh, some maybe some US equipment. I think I can't quite remember exactly what it was, but the idea is that they they are going down the Western route rather than a kind of Soviet era and then Russian kind of military route in terms of arms acquisitions. And their older Soviet era stuff is going to find its way possibly to Ukraine. Well, that looks like what's happening because that's what Russia is attacking. So Maria Zakharova, the Russian foreign ministry's spokeswoman, claimed in a comment to RA Novosti in Ecuador that Ecuador's decision was a breach of contract because the two countries adding uh, between the two countries because it was adding it was made under serious pressure from outside stakeholders. Um, yeah, whatever. Let's uh, let's see those uh, those Soviet era pieces of equipment find their way to Ukraine. Russian M MPs want to raise the draft age to 50 for migrants who have obtained Russian citizenship. The authors of the bill believe that natives of other countries who have become citizens of the Russian Federation evade registration or deliberately wait until the age of conscription. Um, so in other words, you know, rather than waiting till you're too old and then coming to Russia to, to find a job, r the Russians are now moving that age bracket so that they capture more foreign um, migrants uh, and just, you know, co-opt them into fighting their pointless war. Tim White says, I can't help laughing. Careful what you wish for. So if you remember, I, I think I reported on this fairly recently. So a US boxer, uh, what was his name? Kevin Johnson, also a Canadian hockey player, were granted Russian citizenship. Well, a boxer needs great timing. Um, seems Kevin Johnson has that. This week, he picked up his Russia passport after being granted citizenship last month. Today, plans were revealed to conscript neutralized, naturalized, sorry, immigrants, although they seem to be neutralized, I assume if they do this, unfortunately, naturalized immigrants up to the, up to 50 years of age. So it could be like, yay, I'm now Russian. Oh, that's brilliant. For, for whatever weird reason, they decided to go to Russia. And then uh, a few weeks later, they're on, a, they're on the front line in Avdivka getting an ID dropped on their heads. Right, moving on to geopolitical uh, stuff now. Uh, let's try and whiz through this. Um, the EU uh, obviously agreed to send 50 billion euros of aid. Now, all 27 members agreed unanimously. According to multiple sources, Orban not only had to give up his pro-Putin stance, but also received no concessions in return. The Hungarian leadership was hasn't issued any comments. It's an important signal. Europe is taking the war, which Russia has started seriously. Even though the US's help is very important as well, it is imperative that Europeans take the lead, marking uh, the adequate burden sharing. EU leaders have allowed the use of frozen Russian assets to help Ukraine. Notably, this idea was approved by Hungary. The funds are supposed to be used within the framework of the four-year 50 billion aid, uh, euro aid program to Ukraine. So interesting that part of, that fifth, part of the funding for that 50 billion euros will come from frozen Russian assets, and that seems to be quite formally set in place. Reuters saying here that Euro EU funds for Hungary will not be unfrozen. So the idea, so Viktor Orban was going to try and do either get this veto in place on an annual basis so further down the line he could still veto eu aid to ukraine he hasn't got that by the looks of it and the other thing he was going to ask for supposedly was or that the europeans were going to try and um sweet talking with was unfreezing the funding that had been kept back because of democratic backsliding in the eu uh, Orban appears to have got neither of these things and yet is still voted in defense of that so i don't know what arm twisting was done there but it seems to have been incredibly successful from an eu point of view budapest remains unwilling to fulfill the standards prescribed by the eu a euro diplomat told the publication it's really important the eu keeps those um you know, transparency thresholds adhered to that keeps those democratic mechanisms uh the the criteria for getting into the eu upheld by nations who are, are looking to democratically backslide so if they'd unfrozen that funding that would have kind of uh, you know pulled the rug out from under their own desires for uh, having nations continue to adhere to those uh, those guidelines 
those criteria. So Hungary won't receive $6.3 billion from the pan-European budget, which was blocked for the country in 2022. The deal on the aid package for Ukraine will have no impact on this issue. I find it absolutely fascinating. Donald Tusk has slammed Viktor Orban in five different statements. So uh, Donald Tusk, who is a very pro-European, formerly a European um, politician himself, now uh, head of the coalition in Poland, um, is saying uh, some of the things he said were Orban fatigue, security risk, Orban decides if he's in or out, egoistic game. If Orban's position dominates, Ukraine will lose a war. So some of the things in the council have changed very much indeed. This idea that you've got some strong rhetoric coming from within EU, that from a really pro-Ukrainian, pro-EU position. I think Donald Tusk is useful for that. I know some people I argue with don't agree and think Donald Tusk is is wielding power against some of the previous uh, PIS institutions in Poland um, unconstitutionally, uh, but that is up for debate. Uh, nonetheless, he is certainly a strong critic of Orban. Senior US lawmakers on a similar sort of topic here have said they want Hungary to immediately approve Sweden's NATO uh, entry, suggesting Budapest risks permanently damaging its relations with Washington if it does not act. So Budapest has been getting very close with the US uh, over the years because CPAC, the Conservative Conference, has been held in Budapest a number of times. You've got conser Conservative uh, Hungarian influence inside the US as well. Um, I've written on this previously. I wrote quite a big ar article on that with regard to uh, Heritage Foundation and Tucker Carlson and and the influence of Orban and, and Hungary within the US and US within Hungary. But this is a this is a pretty strong statement back to Hungary saying you need to ratify Sweden's accession because Turkey's done it. It's all going well. We're just waiting for you. Don't mess us around. And if that comes from the US, I, I think that could be fairly strong rhetoric there. Senior US lawmakers ask Hungary on February the 1st to immediately approve Sweden's NATO membership, warning of permanent damage to the relations to, between the two countries. Quote, partners don't do these things. And I'm questioning whether they are a trusted ally for our visa waiver program. So there's a, there's a veiled threat there. If you want the visa waiver program to continue, then you need to sort your stuff out. Um, said Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Ben Cardin, referring to the visa program that enables most citizens of the participating 41 countries to travel to the US for 90 days or less without obtaining a visa. Um, Ukraine and Canada agree on security guarantees for Ukraine. The corresponding agreement is at the finish line, Jolie reported during the press conference. Quote, we know that even after the war, Ukraine will remain with such a dangerous neighbor as Russia, so Canada must continue to provide assistance that will be constant and reliable. So this talks to that like long-term commitment to Ukraine. This assistance will include our commitment to long-term security obligations. Um, uh, USA will vote on aid for Ukraine within a week, says Senate leader Chuck Schumer. A new text on strengthening the southern border with Mexico, which we, he hopes will satisfy Republicans, it remains to be seen, will be published in the coming days. Now, on top of that, there are rumours that they might actually separate Ukraine from the border aid uh, um, or the border bill. So that could then signal... Good news for Ukraine. Johnson, Mike Johnson, this chappity chap, uh, says Ukraine aid and border policy reform is likely to be split, according to The Hill. Johnson told the three leaders of the Baltic parliaments that Biden's national security supplemental that includes aid for Ukraine is likely to be split over uh, up over concerns about the border. I guess what the Republicans might want to do is say, OK, we will give in on, on aid to Ukraine because actually... It might damage us going forward if we refuse that. But we are staying strong on the border. I, As I said to you yesterday, the board immigration is the one thing that remains that they can campaign on. And even though a, a bipartisan bill would be precisely what they would have wanted in any other year, right? this is an election year and I can see them refusing to do anything on the border because if they do something on the border, they have nothing to campaign on. They've lost Roe v. Wade. They've lost the border. And immigration is this big trigger uh, subject that is has quite cross-party appeal at the moment. And they know that if they, if they, you know, if they do this deal on the border, then they will, they will be able, they will be going to their electorate, the, the electorate and their voters empty-handed. Are like, well, we're going to campaign on uh, war on Christmas, uh, uh, transgender toilets. Uh, it's like they need that to, to, to have something to take to their voters. 
Uh, but I, but I think they they might get to a point where they realise that keeping the aid from Ukraine could damage the US in the long run. Not just in terms of like damage voter um, support, but just US um, prospects going forward and international prospects. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said that the Senate will vote next week on the National Security Supplemental Bill, which includes a bipartisan deal on the border and immigration restrictions and aid to Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan. I, uh, my guess is that will get through Senate, but what will happen with the House, I don't know. I uh, Maybe some Americans can let me know how, whether... What the situation does Mike Johnson have to table it? I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of the mechanisms there. Um, right. Anyway, moving on. Media has revealed that the Bundestag, so German Parliament deputies, disrupted military aid to Ukraine on the FSB's instructions. So there are uh, agents working within German uh, politics who are agents, FSB agents. Deputies of the Alternative for Germany, AFD, a uh, right wing party that is gaining momentum but is seriously in bed with the FS uh, with with the Kremlin coordinated texts of their speeches with FSB curators and on their instructions sued the government to stop military aid to Ukraine. I mean, just something's got to be done about that, uh, really. And indeed, the insiders come out with a big um, article investigating. So Russia has proven to have more ties with Germany's far-right AFD, a native of Ukraine turned traitor to aid the FSB in its aid to block Germany supplying aid to and weapons to Kiev. So this article looks at the far right Bundestag aide and his rapping FSB case officer. I mean, this is true. Like people have been laughing about this, but Michael Weiss was tweeting about his handler being a rapper, a pro-Russian aide to the far right German legislator who attempted to scuffle Berlin's shipment of main battle tanks to Ukraine is an agent of Russian intelligence. The insider can now reveal. Also, his handler is a rapper. Um, anyway, this is just uh, uh, more example, uh, more. Th- Another example of the influence of the FSB of the Kremlin inside Europe. This is a big old investigative piece. I uh, won't go into it now. But yeah, we've got Latvia. We've got Germany. We've got uh, potentially other um, members of the European Parliament being having their strings pulled by the Russians. This is a, a real worry. And this chap here on the right, I think is this guy on the right here, um, a little bit older, uh, so, media, Ukrainian-born advisor to far-right German AFD lawmaker is allegedly an FSB agent. Vladimir Sergienko, a Ukrainian-born advisor to a German lawmaker from the AFD party, is allegedly working with Russian FSB. Um, but look who he's with here. <laughs> oh, how convenient. He's sat with Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter is an agent of the FSB. And if he's not, he's dumb as a box of rocks. Uh, just... Uh, and he's just uh, a useful idiot that is being manipulated by the FSB so overtly. Um, there you go. Right, Turkish banks have started closing accounts of Russian companies. Yes, businessmen who do business with Turkey would have told Russian journalists about this. In addition, some banks have begun to impose higher requirements on Russians who wish to open new accounts. I don't know whether people like the US have got uh, got hold of some of these banks and said, yeah, yeah, if you want these, if, if Turkey, if you want these F-16s, if you want to be back on the F-35 program, and if you don't want your banks to be sanctioned or punished by US or sort of devalued in deals, uh, then you need to start upholding some of these sanctions. And so Turkish banks appear to be, uh, I don't know whether that, that's what's happened, but they are certainly uh, appearing to be stricter with Russians than they previously were. Russia has reduced gasoline exports to non-CIS. So CIS is like this group of countries that's kind of like sort of equivalent to NATO, those countries of, of Eurasia, um, so Russia has reduced gasoline exports to non-CIS countries. So they're still keeping up exports to those countries that they keep close to their, their sphere of influence to compensate for unplanned repairs at refineries as Russia grapples with the impact of fires and drone attacks on its energy infrastructure. This is having a really meaningful impact on the Russian ability to uh, fund the war. More than 60,000 people in Slovakia took part in protests against the plans of the government of Robert Fitzo to carry out a reform of the criminal law. This is based Basically looking very much like what um, Hungary did under Orban with democratic backsliding. Judiciary is always one of the first things to go. And the same with PIS in Poland. This is one of the ongoing issues that, that uh, Donald Tusk has is with the impact PIS in Poland had on 
not only the judiciary but also the media companies the, the state media companies and it's the same in hungary robert fitzos looking to do that in slovakia it appears implies mitigation of penalties for some crimes and elimination of the special prosecutor's office local media reports it's 60,000 people still on the streets there this is significant and you know the work of robert fitzo to align itself more align the country more with with russia needs to be uh, needs to be dealt with and it looks like the people are, are taking to the streets so that's good Finally, Armenia has joined the Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court, granting it authority to arrest Russian leader Vladimir Putin on its territory. So this is basically uh, the International Criminal Court s signing the Rome Statute means that they have to adhere to uh, International Criminal Court regulations uh, and decisions. And this, is, this decision suggests significant diplomatic shift as a country takes steps to distance itself from Russia. Actually, I think that decision has more to do with Azerbaijan. So what they want to do is hold Azerbaijan accountable for actions in, in their tensions, in their, in their sort of conflict with Azerbaijan, so that war crimes can be, um, can be adjudicated upon uh, by the International Criminal Court. The flip side is that this will also mean they would have to arrest Putin and be came to Armenia. But I think, I think the... The desire there is more to do with Azerbaijan than than wanting to ar arrest Putin. However, this is what the lead Prime Minister Pashinyan has just said. Uh, Russia can no longer be Armenia's main military partner for both objective and subjective reasons. So objective reasons means that actually, you know, it's just not useful. That you, you can't commit to us because you don't have the ability because you're fighting other wars. And actually, uh, you, some of your equipment's not as good as, it, as, as we would like. And all these kind of objective reasons. And then subjectively, you guys suck. <laughs> you guys didn't come and help us. You were more worried about uh, Ukraine. And so you guys suck so objective and subjective reasons we're just gonna pal ourselves up with you know the west more or maybe china more i don't know but this is a, a kick in the shins for russia that's for sure with one of the cis kind of nations although i think armenia might be dropping out of cis have they dropped out i don't know uh yeah not good for russia good for ukraine anyway that's a, another long one for me goodness me there's so much news at the moment i'm so sorry that these videos are like much longer than i'd ideally like them to be there's just so much to report on and um and I think it's really important that we get this full picture. Uh, I think by doing this every day, we just have um, this macro and micro understanding of, of everything that's happening with the Ukraine war. Uh, and, and hopefully the picture is accurate. Um, anyway, thanks so much for your support. Take care. And I'd better go and get ready for another couple of hours of talking. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, with Daniela from uh, Tochny. So please stay tuned for that.